Steve Jobs was a master of persuasion. He persuaded billions of us to buy MP3 players, laptops and phones, usually at a higher price than what we would have paid before. Now much of this is due to technological innovations and unparalleled marketing, but some of it is down to his persuasion techniques, techniques that all of us can learn and adopt. Now let's start by taking a listen to this keynote from Steve Jobs. It's his first keynote back at Apple, recorded in 1998. He's been rehired as the interim CEO. While he was away from the company, Apple started to fail. Revenues fell and profits dwindled. It was vital for Steve Jobs in this keynote to rebuild confidence in Apple. Here's what he chooses to say. It's been 10 months since a new management team took over at Apple. People have been working really hard. You can see a lot of cars in the parking lots and nights and the weekends. And because of their hard work, I'm really pleased to report to you today that Apple's back on track. And What do you notice? What stands out? Well, there's one tactic he is using to build confidence in Apple, to make viewers and investors value the company more. And he uses this tactic time and time again. He uses it when introducing the iPhone. This is a day... I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. And then during one of his last keynotes, when he introduced a new version of the iOS. About 10 years ago, we had one of our most important insights. And that was that the PC was going to become the digital hub for your digital life. Steve Jobs regularly chooses to start his keynotes by highlighting the amount of work Apple has done, how they've been working weekends for the past 10 months, how he's been looking forward to this keynote for over two years, how 10 years ago they discovered an insight that led to the innovation you'll see today. This can't be by accident. Steve almost always highlights the labour that has gone into his work. Why does Steve do this? Well, because Steve knows the power of the labour illusion. The labour illusion is a fairly simple psychological principle. If you see the labour going into a task, you will value the end product more. If you see chefs cooking your food, you'll say the food tastes better. If your real estate agent spends hours crafting a bespoke list of houses for you to view, you'll value those houses more. In fact, a paper published this year called Pulling Back the Curtain found that going on a brewery tour and seeing the work that goes into making beer will make visitors 32% more likely to buy that beer than if they hadn't seen behind the scenes. The labour illusion is powerful, and Steve understood this, so he took every possible chance to emphasise the work that's gone into creating something. So when he introduces the new iPod Nano, he doesn't start by telling you what features it has. He starts by looking back at the previous four generations and all the work they've done. This is the first generation Nano. It was a breakthrough, the first high capacity flash based music player. And it was a stunner when it first came out. The next generation, we took it to extruded aluminum. It's even better. The third generation, The fourth generation had an even taller screen on it, and the most recent generation an even taller screen. Now, how do we make this better? As I shared in the previous episode of Nudge on Steve Jobs, that was part one of this two-part special, Steve deeply understood the psychological principles that influenced people. He knew exactly what persuaded people and what convinced people, and he adopted several of these principles in his work. Not just in his keynote presentations, but in the advertising he commissioned for Apple. One of the principles he used was the halo effect. The halo effect is a bias that all of us have. It means that if we have positive associations with a person, we'll often have positive associations with the things that person is associated with. So if you like George Clooney, you'll be more inclined to try the coffee he's promoting, and you might even say it tastes better once you know he's promoted it. Thorndike, an American psychologist, discovered the halo effect way back in 1920. His study revealed that employers would rank attractive people as more competent in their job. Their appearance, including how attractive and well-groomed they were, would 
influence how competent the employer presumed them to be. Their attractiveness gave them a metaphoric halo. This same effect happens in school, too. A study by Hurry and McDavid found that teachers' perceptions of students changed based on the attractiveness of their first name. Overall, the study found that essays with names that were associated with positive stereotypes received higher grades. I tested the halo effect for myself on this very podcast, Nudge. I gathered 200 people and asked them if they would listen to my podcast. One half of the participants saw my podcast logo when they were asked. So they saw the logo and I asked, would you listen to this podcast? The other half saw my logo alongside a bunch of other very popular podcasts. I asked the same question, would you listen to this podcast? But my logo was with other popular podcasts. I wanted to see if merely being in the presence of other popular podcasts would boost the likelihood that people would listen to Nudge. And it turns out people were three times more likely to listen to Nudge Podcast when it was pictured alongside other well-known shows. Steve Jobs knew the power of the halo effect. He knew that successful, courageous, admirable people had this halo effect. And he wanted to associate his brand, Apple, with those people. So he did so in one of the best performing campaigns of all time. The Think Different campaign. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers. Steve Jobs cried when he first saw this ad. He loved it. He called it complete purity. It pictures some of the world's greatest individuals, the likes of Gandhi, Einstein, John Lennon, Picasso. These are risk takers, entrepreneurs, innovators. The advert linked these people with Apple. It said these great people... They're like Apple. They think different. It's classic halo effect. Because we have positive associations with these great people, we associate those positive feelings with Apple. And it worked. The campaign saved Apple from bankruptcy and propelled them to success. It is the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. The ad won the 1998 Emmy for Best Commercial and the 2000 Grand Eiffel Award for the most effective campaign in America. It marked the re-emergence of Apple as a global powerhouse and reversed Apple's decline in market share. The slogan behind the campaign, Think Different, is so successful that as of 2020, it is still printed on the back of the iMac box. It's no wonder Steve loved it. He understood the power of the halo effect. He knew that by associating Apple with these greats, it would boost the people's perception of Apple, just like it boosts the perceived value of my podcast with the test I ran. There's even more behavioural science packed into this, though. If you look at the slogan, you'll notice something interesting about it. Think different. Now, this slogan is more memorable than a normal slogan, but why? Why is it more memorable? Well, it's because it sounds strange on purpose. In the book, Read Me, 10 Lessons for Writing Great Copy, the authors suggest that Apple purposefully used the sort of poorly written slogan, Think Different, rather than the more appropriate, Think Differently, because the weird version, the think different version, is just more memorable. Twisting the language just a little makes the slogan stand out and stick in the mind. It's the same reason why Alexander the Meerkat in the UK says simples, not simple, and why 7up promoted itself as the uncola. Standing out increases memorability. Steve uses this principle with the think different campaign and later in his career with the iMac launch. During the keynote for the iMac launch, Steve loaded up a slide containing a picture of all the current desktops on the market. A really big deal. Now, what should it be? Well, we went out and we looked at all of the consumer products out there. This is a picture of one of the better ones. And we noticed some things about them pretty much universally. <clears throat> the first is they're really slow. They're very slow. They're all using last year's processor. Second is they've all got pretty crummy displays on them. They're generally 13 inch, a few 14 inch, and the quality of them is very poor. And these things are ugly. (laughs) So, distinct imagery stands out in our minds. This is known as the von Restroff effect. 
Her research shows that numbers are 30 times more memorable when placed alongside letters in a memory test. Almost 100 years after her, her research was conducted, Richard Schotten replicated the research, this time finding that one brand from a different category, say fast food, is four times more memorable when placed alongside multiple brands from one category, say the automotive industry. Standing out increases memorability, and Steve applied this effect with the iMac. On screen was a picture of all the existing desktops on the market all grey and all ugly, according to Steve. Then, on stage, he whipped off a black cloth to reveal the iMac, and it had this distinct curved design and a distinctive blue case. This is the 1998 edition of the iMac, and it helped change the trajectory of Apple, finally returning the company to profits after years of decline. Much of that is down to its technological capacity, but Steve understood that that alone isn't enough. To persuade buyers, they'll need to remember the iMac, and to make them remember it, it'll need to stand out in comparison to its competitors. So he designed the iMac with seven distinct colours, green, yellow, orange, pink, purple, blue and silver. Most technically minded CEOs would laugh at this. Why would you bother? Surely it's what's inside that counts. But Steve knew that that wasn't the case. All too often, psychological innovations have the same impact as technological innovations. Okay, we've covered the Think Different campaign, we have covered the launch of the iMac, and the use of the labour illusion, but we haven't even got on to Steve's favourite persuasion technique, the one he used time and time again to sell the iPod, pitch the iPhone, and announce the iPad. There is a cognitive bias that affects all of us, even you. It's called anchoring. It means when presented with new information, you'll be heavily influenced by a particular reference point or anchor. In the last episode on Steve Jobs, I shared how it can be used to make wine seem like good value or absurdly expensive. Dan Ariely, in his book Predictably Irrational, shows how anchoring is even more powerful than that in some subtle ways. He asked students to pull out their social security cards and look at the last two digits. This is in the US where everyone has a social security card and the numbers on those cards are just completely random. There is no correlation between the digits on your cards and your income, for example. He split the students into two groups, those with high numbers on their card and those with low numbers on their card. He then asked them to bid on a number of items like a keyboard, French wine, a book, but to keep their high or low security card number in their mind. And he found that the students who were anchored by a higher social security number bid more for the items, three times more on average. An initial reference point can influence our subsequent purchase decisions. And no one, I think, knew this more than Steve Jobs. Here's how Steve Jobs used anchoring to launch the iPod. Now remember, the iPod was expensive, much more expensive than traditional MP3s, so to make it seem like better value, he created a new anchor. Not the price of the MP3 player, but the price per song. You can buy a MP3 CD player, or you can buy a hard disk-based jukebox player. These are the four choices for portable music right now. So let's take a look at each one of those. A CD player costs about $75, holds 10 to 15 songs on a CD, that's about $5 a song. You can go buy a flash player, pay about double that, about $150, holds the same 10 to 15 songs, or about $10 a song. You can go buy an MP3 CD player, and an MP3 CD, uh, which you can burn on your computer, costs about $150, but holds 150 songs, you get down to a dollar a song. Or you can go buy a hard drive jukebox player for about $300. It holds about 1,000 songs and costs about 30 cents a song. So we looked at this and studied all these, and that's where we want to be. And we are introducing a product today that takes us exactly there, and that product is called iPod. The iPod cost $399. The normal price of an MP3 at the time was $150. The iPod was more than double that. Usually this would kill a new product. No one can charge two times more and expect to capture more than 50% market share. But that's what Steve did, because he set a new price anchor. Price per song. The iPod cost $250 more than an MP3, 
but per song, it was 60% cheaper. It's a genius bit of anchoring by Steve, which has been copied by dozens of other brands, most famously Nespresso capsules. These RRP at 50 cents per capsule. That's insanely expensive for a cup of coffee at home, especially when you compare it to ground coffee or instant coffee. In most cases, that is 10 times more expensive to your other at-home coffee brands. But Nespresso set a new anchor by comparing themselves to the coffee you'd buy at a cafe. They'd compare themselves to a $3 coffee at Starbucks. And now Nespresso looks cheap. Just for a fraction of the cost of what you'd pay at Starbucks, you can get a Nespresso. And that anchoring helped Nespresso capture 34% of the coffee capsule market. Anchoring can be used to change the perception of your price from, gee, that's 2.5 times more expensive, to, well, that's pretty good value. But Steve Jobs doesn't just use anchoring to make the iPod seem like good value. He uses it to highlight how portable the iPod is. What's, what's so special about iPod here? It's ultra portable. An iBook is really portable, but this is ultra portable. <laughs> and let me show you what I mean. iPod is the size of a deck of cards. A deck of cards. It is 2.4 inches wide. It is 4 inches tall. This is tiny. It also only weighs six and a half ounces. That is lighter than most of the cell phones you have in your pockets right now. So this is what's so remarkable about iPod. It is ultra portable. Steve could just say it's ultra portable. He could just read out the measurements and announce how much it weighs. He could just take it out of his pocket and show it. But he doesn't. He wants to anchor the audience first. He wants them to truly believe it is ultra portable by comparing it to familiar anchors. So he uses three anchors in that 40-second segment, comparing it to the size of a deck of cards, saying it's more portable than the iBook, and saying it's lighter than the cell phone in your pocket. And we know Steve doesn't do this by accident. He knows how powerful anchoring is because he does it time and time again. Just listen to how he launches the iPod Nano in the 2005 keynote. It's really small. <laughs> Let me show you how small this is. This thing is thinner than a number two pencil. Thinner than a number two pencil. Now, let's go ahead and compare it to the original iPod. This is the original iPod that also held a thousand songs in your pocket. The iPod Nano is 80% smaller in volume than the original iPod. 80% smaller means it's 20% of the size. It's one-fifth the size of the original iPod that we shipped less than four years ago. Okay, let's compare it to the iPod mini. The iPod mini, an incredibly successful product. The iPod nano is half the thickness. It's 62% smaller by volume. That means it's almost one third the size. Now let's take a look at some competitors. Some of their flash products here. Here's iRiver, 68% smaller. It's one third the size of a competing player that doesn't hold anywhere near the number of songs. Here's another one by a company called Creative. I think it's called their Zen Player. Again, 69% smaller, one third the size. Here's another one. I think this is the Zen Neon. 58% smaller, less than half the size. You get the picture. Steve loves anchoring. And it's no surprise. It was the best way to help people understand and appreciate the significance of his innovations. During that keynote, Steve mentions a famous line, one that marketers and advertising folks across the globe admire. A thousand songs in your pocket. Now, I've spoken about this tagline before on the pod, and I've talked about why it is so successful. And long story short, it uses everyday language that we all understand. While other competitors were talking about how many gigabytes they had and what their bit rate was, Apple used terms that your grandma would know. A thousand songs in your pocket. I'm not sure how much involvement Steve had with the tagline, but I wouldn't be surprised if he played a part. After all, it's anchoring. And just in case you were still on the fence about how important anchoring was to Steve Jobs, take a listen to this 2010 keynote for the iPad, nine years after the iPod had launched. And I am thrilled to announce to you that the iPad pricing starts not at $9.99, but at just... $499. 
Did you hear it? Not at $999, but at just $499. That smashing sound, by the way, is a custom animation that Steve asked to be put in. On the screen behind him, the $999 price is actually crushed by the actual $499 price. Steve literally crushes his anchor, and the crowd goes wild for it. Okay, let's move on from anchoring. I've spent the previous episode and the first part of this episode reviewing Steve Jobs' persuasion techniques, and that review obviously wouldn't be complete without taking a look at the iPhone. The iPhone is undoubtedly Steve Jobs' greatest success. It is the best-selling product of all time. That's right, the best-selling product of all time. Over 1 billion have been sold. That is more than double the next best-selling product, which is the Harry Potter book series. Now, this doesn't obviously include consumable goods like Coca-Cola, but it is still impressive. The iPhone will go down in history. But let's take a look at where it all started. The iPhone announcement keynote. In this keynote, Steve Jobs uses a number of nudges that we've covered so far. He uses the labor illusion. This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. He also uses anchoring. And today, we're going to show you a software breakthrough. Software that's at least five years ahead of what's on any other phone. But one of the most interesting persuasion technique he uses is chunking. Simply put, chunking means that people remember grouped information better than individual information. Grouping or chunking, as it's known, helps with recall. Now, Steve Jobs had a bit of a problem. The iPhone had hundreds of new features, each of them noteworthy. But each individual feature would be hard to remember. So Steve chunks the core benefits into three categories. Today, we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. The first one is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. The second is a revolutionary mobile phone. And the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. Rather than listing dozens of features, Steve groups them into three categories. This helps people remember the key benefits. And it also triggers the labor illusion. You think, gee, they built three unique products here. But then Steve reveals the twist. These aren't three different products. Three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device, an iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator, an iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device, and we are calling it iPhone. Today, today Apple is going to reinvent the phone. If you're trying to persuade someone, don't list every benefit. Don't walk through every feature. Group your benefits together. Highlight three unique benefits and that'll be far more persuasive. This tactic of focusing your message on what's really important is a tactic that Steve lived by. He knew that the world was noisy and that most people won't remember 90% of what you say. So you have to be specific, you have to be clear, and you have to be focused. Don't just take my word for it. Here's Steve talking through his approach to marketing. Marketing's about values. This is a very complicated world. It's a very noisy world. And we're not going to get a chance to get people to remember much about us. No company is. And so we have to be really clear on what we want them to know about us. Now, those of you who are familiar with Steve's keynotes will know that I am missing one more thing. Literally, one more thing. This is how Steve ended almost all of his keynotes, holding back one more exciting feature or benefit, saving it till the end. He'd say, oh, just before I go, here's one more thing. He did it with the iPod. There's just one more thing about the iPod mini, which is it comes in colors. So in addition to silver, we have gold. 
He did it with iTunes. Well, there is one more thing that we're announcing today that you can buy off the iTunes Music Store, and that is TV shows. Now, it's how he introduced FaceTime. This is probably my favorite one more thing. But there is one more thing. <laughs> and I think it's best that I just show you. Hey, Johnny. And the tradition even continued after Steve Jobs had passed away, with Tim Cook introducing Apple Music. One more thing. I'd like to tell you about something that we've been working really hard on and something we are super excited about. Today we're announcing Apple Music, the next chapter in music, and I know you are going to love it. You'll notice a bit of labor illusion used by Tim Cook there, showing that many of Steve's persuasion techniques are still being used by the folks at Apple today. But what is it about these one more thing endings? Why did Steve insist on them? Well, it's down to the recency bias. The recency bias is a psychological principle that shows how we favor and remember recent events over historical ones. If you give participants a list of things to remember, they are more likely to remember whatever was last on that list. If you give participants a bunch of chocolates that all taste similar and then say, this is your last chocolate, they'll rank that last chocolate as the most flavoursome 60% of the time, even when the taste is identical. We have a strong preference for whatever comes last. It's why a lawyer spends most of her time preparing the closing argument, and it's why good TV shows always leave you on a cliffhanger. Steve knew the power of these final moments, so rather than ending on a whimper and dampening the value of the presentation, Steve would hold one cool feature back right until the end. There's one study from 1993 that highlights why this is so important, and perhaps this study inspired Steve. The study is by Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman. His team exposed a group of students to two particularly uncomfortable experiments, both involving bone-chilling cold water. In the first trial, students were asked to hold their hands in an ice bath at 14 centigrade for a total of 16 seconds. In the second trial, they were instructed to plunge their other hand into the very same water for the same duration, but this time keep their hands submerged for an additional 30 seconds while the temperature was raised ever so slightly to 15 degrees. Following these first two trials, the students were given a choice of which condition they would do again if forced. Now, for those of you listening, the answer should seem obvious. Most of you should go for option one. It is shorter. It's only 60 seconds long. That second option is almost identical, but it has 30 extra seconds with your hand kept in the water at 15 degree heat, which is still bone chillingly cold. So we know objectively that the second option is worse. But when asked to repeat the experiment again, most students opted for the second option with a longer amount of time in the water, but a slightly less uncomfortable finish. Kahneman concluded that subjects choose the longer experiment simply because they love the memory of it better than the alternative. This experiment uncovered a fascinating element of our evolved psychology. How things end dramatically changes our perception. Steve Jobs knew that exciting endings weren't a nice to have. They were vital in changing the perception of the whole event. It's why he ended one of his very first keynotes with a violinist playing a symphony with his next computer. And it's why he added one more thing onto almost all of his Apple keynotes. Steve Jobs knew how to persuade. He systematically applied psychological principles of persuasion across his work. He used it to craft the most persuasive presentations, create memorable marketing, and to motivate his team to do the impossible. Steve is a one-of-a-kind genius. There is no denying that. But what I find interesting is that he still chooses to use these principles. I find this eye-opening. You might assume that someone of his intelligence, his genius, just wouldn't bother with this. Why bother trying to persuade someone when everything you create is so great? Yet Steve knew something that all too many of us forget. Most technological innovations won't survive without psychological persuasion. 
Google Glass, Microsoft Zoom, 3D TV, Concord. These are all impressive technological innovations that failed because they couldn't persuade the masses to use them. And if there's one takeaway from this episode, it's this. If an entrepreneur as wildly successful as Steve Jobs studies and applies and repeatedly uses nudges in his work, then surely the rest of us should too.